Folks, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. I'm out of here. Bye-bye. Okay, no, really. We need to do this clove oil lab together, right? We need to learn how to extract essential oils from products, and we're just so happy picking cloves in this experiment. So we need to go through and talk about the lab procedure, the lab directions, and so forth. And that's what we're going to do as a lab partner together. So let's talk about the glassware setup First, that's where we're going to start. So the very first thing that I'm going to pull out the drawer is something called a Florence flask. It's like Florence Henderson or Florence in the machine. This is a Florence flask. Well, what's the thing with the Florence flask? It looks like a round bottom, doesn't it? Well, no, not quite. You're close. It does look like a round bottom. It does look like a round bottom that we've used before in other labs. But the difference is that it has a very flat bottom. It can sit on a flat surface, a.k.a. hot plate. And one of the reasons I'm choosing a Florence flask here is because the only thing that we're going to put into this is some water. That's it. We're going to put water in it. Okay, so if I put water in it, I have no problems, no weird feelings about burning water. So this is kind of silly, right? I don't need a heating mantle. I don't need a variac. I just need to put this sucker on a hot plate, turn up the heat, and let the water boil. That's all that I need to do. And that's why Florence Flask is okay with our steam generator, because this is what will be producing the steam. All right, something else that we need is something called a Clayson adapter. A Clayson adapter was also used in another lab, the Transcinamic lab, and we talked about the purpose of the Clayson adapter. They're perfect as far as being able to joint together two different pieces of the glassware setup. Well, what you're going to see in the next image probably is the Clayson adapter getting attached to the bowling flask or the round bottom Florence flask. I know that's a jumbled up words, isn't it? I'm, I'm confusing my words, people. I'm confusing my words. My Florence flask. And we'll talk about the two adapters up here at the very top. When I take the Clayson adapter, I'm going to put it onto the Florence flask and this will be my setup in the very beginning. Now up here at the very top, what's not really shown is going to be a cap, a lid. And the reason that I'm putting the lid up here is because I can take this off at any point in time throughout the steam distillation and I can add water back into the bowling flask or the Florence flask, excuse me, the Florence flask that sits down below. It provides me very easy access. It allows me to do this as many times as I need to do it without taking the glassware setup apart. Could you imagine, could you imagine just like before, taking this super hot steamed glassware and dislocating them just to add water into this super hot Florence flask that sits down here below and then connecting them back together? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not that crazy. So I put a lid up here at the top, and that allows me to add water when I need to add water, if I need to add water throughout this process. So as the steam travels up, it will hit that lid. It can't go anywhere, and it says, oh, okay. So over here to the right-hand side, it goes up this part of the Clayson conductor. Uh, uh, Clayson uh, adapter, and it goes into the next part of the laboratory uh, apparatus. All right, so there's the Clayson and the Florence flask together. The next thing that I need is a biomass flask. Okay, so let's talk about the biomass. This is used for a number of different purposes, not just what we're using it for today, but it normally does hold solids, and there's different reasons for me to use something like this. But one of the most common is I'm putting solids into this mix somehow, some form, some fashion. So if this is crushed up lavender bud or crushed up rose hip or, uh, you know, the uh, rind from an orange or a lemon or a lime or a grapefruit, uh, and here we're using clove. So this is where I'm going to put the cloves that we're going to be using in the lab experiment. So this biomask flask will sit on top of the Clayson adapter. So I'm assembling the pieces as I go. So now what will happen 
is that my water will generate steam. Steam will travel up the Florence flask into the Claisen condenser. And then from the Claisen condenser, it's got nowhere else to go but up. So it goes into my biomask flask. And this is where all of my clove will be located. So the hot steam is going to hit the clove buds. And this is what will begin to extract the clove essential oil from that plant material, all right? So this is the process of setting up the glassware and we're not quite finished yet. So once the steam makes its way through the bio mask flask, where does it go? It's gonna be carrying my clove oil. So how do I get it into a container? Well, up at the top, I'm gonna to have to put some type of adapter. And I chose a sidearm adapter, but I could have also chosen a gooseneck adapter. So a gooseneck adapter looks just like this, except it completely curves. There is no place up here for a joint or a lid or a thermometer probe or whatever the case was. This was just the first thing that I grabbed. Either one of these would be okay. I'm not terribly afraid that I'm going to be losing material through this adapter because once more I'm putting a cap onto this joint as well. So a gooseneck is very similar to a sidearm adapter which I have here that's holding up in the picture. The gooseneck though just doesn't have this joint up here at the very top and that will for sure prevent your loss from anything. It forces it to go over and through the West condenser and drip on the other side where you've got your collection flask. All right, so either one of those would be okay. Uh, before I go further though, I actually need some cotton. And the reason I need some cotton is for the biomask flask. You're probably wondering, well, wait a minute, if I get this biomask flask up here at the top, how do I put my cloves in there? Won't they just fall through? And the answer is, yeah, they will. They will fall through. So we want to prevent that from happening. So how do we do it? Well, we'll cram one of those joints with cotton. Now, cheesecloth could have worked. A uh, gauze could have worked. Just something that I could have wrapped up the cloves with into a nice little pocket of material and then just cram them down into the biomask flask. But folks, I didn't have any cheesecloth or gauze in the lab on that particular day and I wasn't going to go out and buy any just to come back to do this. I wanted to do it now. I'm like that little girl off of Willy Wonka. I want it now, daddy. Okay, well here I've got cotton and cotton is what we had and cotton I was going to make do with. So what I decided to do is take the cotton and cram it into the joint. On a normal day, what I would have done is I would have taken the cloves and I would have put it into some type of sachet like the gauze or the cheesecloth and I would have tied it up, almost like an herb uh, basket, if that's what you want to call it, uh, that some people use for soups and stews and so forth. So I would have crammed that whole thing down into the biomass flask and it would not have went through the neck at that point. So... Think of tea bags and that type of thing. We can make something similar with clove or the material that we want to extract up here at the very top. All right, so now that I've got the sidearm going on, that sidearm, as you can see here, that sidearm is going to go into what we call a West condenser. You've seen the West condensers before. I'm bringing it back one more time. And we need to hook up water to this West condenser. So as you can imagine, the water in will go from the bottom and then it will circulate up through the West condenser to keep the whole thing cold. And then that water will go out in this direction. So water in from the bottom, water out from the top. That is the setup every single time. On this West condenser, over on the right-hand side, we need something that we can collect our oil with, right? So I need some type of drip adapter that I need to connect on the end of that West condenser. So this will direct the flow, and it's going to direct the flow into a fairly large beaker that I have sitting down below it. So this will help it as it condenses to be collected into my receiving flask or container. And in this case, it's nothing more than just a big 300, 500 mil beaker. Um, you'll see that in just a second. Okay. 
All right, uh, everything gets held together like normal through the use of these clips. It just helps ensure that I don't really get any loose joints that begin to happen in the setup. Uh, the clips sometimes are called joint clips, sometimes they're called T clips, but it holds all the glassware together. So when I show you the picture of all of it put together at one time, you're going to see those onto the joint areas for that reason. Okay, so before I do that, uh, we have cloves, right? And here is the cloves that I have in the lab. Uh, Badia cloves found at the Food Line grocery store in Leland. And uh, the lab directions tell you to use about 5 grams. So if you look at these bags, we normally let a person use one bag per. So this is about 7 grams in total. The issue, though, in the past is that our yields are sometimes very low. And the reason is because this 7 grams, yeah, that's a great number. It says 5 grams in the book. But this 7 grams is going to be the stem and it's going to be the bud. It's going to be both. If you look at the way that those cloves are in that packet, you're getting the bud and the stem. Well, if you look in Merck or if you do your online research, you're going to discover that the essential oil is more concentrated in one over the other. So I'll let you figure that out if you've not seen that yet. But I do want you to understand that we up the amount of grams for this lab procedure because what we have access to that's fairly cheap is the bud and the stem both. So some of this weight is almost useless. And that's because there's hardly any clove oil that will be found in that part of the material. So we always at least double, if we can, the amount. And what you're going to see here is that I'm using probably a bag and a half, if not a little more. Okay. All right, if I zoom in, uh, and there's your label information, by the way, uh, for the cloves. So if I zoom in, so that way you can see the cloves uh, themselves, you can see the bud and the stem both. I mean, there's one part up here at the top, and then you have the stem part that's down here below. Uh, I did use about one and a half packs. I'll show you how much I've actually weighed out uh, in just a minute. But before we weigh it out, folks, we've got to crush them. We have to increase the surface area, right? So if we increase the surface area, we can extract this clove oil a little bit faster and we help this process go even um, quicker than what the steam would actually do on its own. All right, so before I do that, I just have a video that I would like to show you of the cloves, so just bear with me just a second. Folks, here's the clove uh, that we are using for the clove oil uh, extraction. And what you're seeing in my hand is the clove bud and the stem. We're actually using both parts of the clove here. Uh, so keep that in mind when you do some of these calculations. I'm just going to take a mortar and pestle, and I'm just going to kind of crush up the cloves, acting like I'm making a tincture or maybe an at-home muddled drink in my kitchen for later enjoyment. So here here we get a crucible and a mortar. I'm just crushing, crushing, crushing as much as I can. I'll turn this stuff into something that looks close to a powder, but I still have some pretty large fragments too at the same time. So uh, this is the process of crushing up the clove and preparing them for the steam distillation. A muddled drink? What's he talking about? Something like a mojito. You know, nice basil, kind of crushed up. Uh, you don't want to uh, bruise it too much. So a mortar and pestle makes a great job at that process, by the way. All right, so let's take a look at the cloves. Uh, here, I've taken the cloves. I've dumped them into the uh, mortar and pestle. I'm going to get ready to crush, 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 crush. And uh, that will help extract some of that essential oil uh, from the very beginning. The problem is that I don't want to do it all at once and I don't want to do it too finely. Uh, the reason as I do it and as I agitate them more and more, I could be disturbing some of the clove oil and I could be smearing it onto the inside of the surface. And if that begins to happen, then I'm going to lose some of that clove oil throughout this process. So I do want to crush them, but I don't want to go overboard with it so just get them a nice little squeeze 
give them a nice little place where they can kind of hang out and feel good about themselves, almost like a little massage. So we are massaging our clove oil or our clove buds right now. So just a little crush, that's all you need. Again, increases the surface area. It helps release the oils a little bit more, but I don't want to sit here forever and I don't want to turn this into a mush. So I go to the balance, I tear out the balance, 0, 0.0000 grams, and I'm getting ready to weigh the amount of cloves that I'm getting ready to add into that glassware setup. All right, so I take the crushed cloves, I then take it to the balance, and this is the mass of those cloves, 11.7329 gram. Well, I told you the cotton's going to cram up the plug of the biomask flask. So at this point, I take the cloves and I dump it down into the biomask flask. And that's what you're seeing here. And you can see my cotton plug that's down here below. I do have some concern with the cotton. I'll go ahead and tell you. What I was worried about is that the cotton would get loose and it would actually fall through the Clayson adapter. And all of my cloves would basically be dumped into the bowling flask that sits down below. I didn't want that to happen, but that was a risk that I was willing to take. And if it did, I was going to have to do it all over again. All right, so after I transfer the cloves, this is what I have left over. Just a little bit of what I would call residue that's there in my way boat. And that's okay. Uh, you know, I could have added water and squirted this out and added it to the biomass flask maybe. But that was something that I was just willing to take a hit on as far as the loss goes. I don't think there's going to be a lot of clove oil left over in that tiny residue right there. All right, so let me show you a video of the setup, a visual uh, live feed of what the setup looks like once it's all put together. Okay, so we're getting ready to show you the clove setup for the steam distillation. And what you see here is just a plain old hot uh, plate uh, with a flat top. And that's because I've picked a bowling flask that's actually not a bowling flask. It is a bowling flask that has a flat bottom. Sometimes we call these Florence flask in a laboratory. So I'm going to put water into this flask. There's no water in it right now, of course. I'm going to heat this up. This is going to turn into hot steam, which is why we call it steam distillation. This steam is going to rise and it's going to go through the Clayson adapter. This is what we call this piece here. And it will go up into my biomass flask. And this is where my crushed clove is going to be located right now. And it's actually already in here. So the cloves will be located here. They will get hit with hot steam. That steam will extract the clove oil and that clove oil and steam will go up and it will go over through the west condenser and it will drip down into my receiving flask over on the right hand side. Uh, a couple of things I want to note, once again, water in through the bottom and water comes out the top. This adapter, this has a cap so I don't get any loss of evaporation there. And then on the Clayson, I also have a cap here. The reason I use this is because there's a chance that I'm going to have to refill this with water here. So by having this access port where I can simply just open the plug, pour some more water in, and close this back, it makes it very convenient for me. So this is the setup for the steam distillation experiment. All right, folks, so make sure you get that into your lab notebook. I'm sure it's part of the great sheet. All right, folks, so what you're seeing in the image right now is a very simplified version of what we did do in the past. You don't even want to know what we did in the past to uh, try to set up this steam distillation. It was a mess. I hated it. Students hated it. Everyone hated it that had to put it up. All right, so we have gotten better over time, and there is our setup currently for steam distillation. All right, so the biomask flask, let me take a, a look at that a little bit closer. Uh, the cloves go into that flask. This is what they look like at this point. So if you need to make observations about what those cloves look like, before the steam distillation process happened. I think that you can do that through that flask there. If you need to, pause the video, write down what you see, add it to your lab notebook, and move on to the next thing. 
the steam generator. Here's my water. As you can see, I've at least half filled that flask with water. Uh, I'm going to say it's probably more than 250 mils, though. It's a 500 mil Florence flask. So I probably have around 350 to 400, if that, um, water that's getting heated up on that hot plate. So I just basically cranked it up and I just slapped the heat to it because I need this to boil. And the longer I'm going to wait for it to boil, the longer this process is going to take. So water just needs to boil here. That is it. That's all that I need to worry with. So crank the heat up as much as you need to crank it up. It's not going to hurt anything. So this process begins at 1.54 p.m. So at 1.54 I add the water, turn the hot plate on, and then go with it. All right, so it is beginning to heat. And I can see that in the picture, right? Uh, I can see my water here, but look at all this condensation that's happening in the Clayson adapter at this point. All right, so all of that condensation is a very good sign that this water is turning into a vapor. This vapor is escaping into the Clayson at this point. And in the Clayson, it's a little cold in the beginning. So it's condensing that vapor down to a water, and then that water is dripping back down into my Florence flask that sits here below. All right, so this is beginning to heat up. And I start to see that condensate about 216. So, folks, this is about 30 minutes, okay? About 30 minutes it takes that water to heat up, to start turning into a vapor, to start condensing onto the sides of the Clayson condenser or adapter and then fall back down into the boiling flask. All right. So the condensation in the biomask flask, well, it eventually gets there. All right. So as you can imagine, as condensation happens in here, eventually it's going to heat this up and it can escape the Clayson adapter. And then that steam can manage to go up into the bio mask flask that's sitting up here with my clove and I can actually see that you can see that condensation all on the sides of the bio mask flask which is a very good sign that heat is starting to hit this area and the cloves all right so here's another video for your enjoyment So here's the steam distillation in action. What you're seeing here is a, a flat bottom bowling flask that has nothing but water in it. And I've got the heat cranked on. There you go. There's the setting. And that heat is, of course, turning this liquid water into a vapor. Uh, that water vapor is leaving the flask and it's going through this Clayson tube. You can see all the condensation. And that vapor is eventually making its way up into the area where the cloves have been crushed and put into the flask. If you take a look at what's happening inside of this flask, if I can zoom in a little bit more, you're seeing a lot of condensation around the sides and it's making its way up to the top of that flask. After it leaves that flask, it's going through the side arm adapter and that's what you're seeing here. And this sidearm adapter is delivering all of that vapor through our West condenser where it will go back to a liquid and it will be collected into this flask, receiving flask, beaker that we have over to the right hand side. Folks, this is the steam distillation in action. Once more, you can make your observations. It smells wonderful. It smells like a Thanksgiving dinner in the laboratory right now just due to the cloves that are getting extracted into the biomass flask that you see there. All right, so I'm gonna keep trucking on. I'm gonna let this heat. The directions tell me to keep collecting until no more cloudiness happens in my receiving flask over to the right-hand side. So I'm just gonna keep letting it go. And at any point in time, if this liquid layer into the flask here gets low, I'll just take the cap off add more water, put the cap back on, and that's a quick fix that I can do from that point. 
Okay, so hopefully you feel pretty comfortable with the steam distillation setup. Uh, I did see distill it. Distill it began to happen at 2.40 p.m. Uh, this is when I see my first kind of cloudy drip that comes from the steam distillation. So about one hour, folks, is what it took. One hour of heating that water, getting it to a vapor, extracting that from the clove, heating up the glassware, and condensing over. So no one said this was going to be a very quick process and of course that kind of proves it too at the same time so here's an image of the right hand side of the setup and this is where my receiving beaker is going to be located as you can see i do have some cloudy liquid that's down here on the bottom <clears throat> And here's the drip adapter. You can almost, almost see a cloudy drip that's getting ready to be formed uh, from the collection side. So drops are happening. The question that I always get is when do I know when to stop? Well, the lab directions are going to tell you that. The lab directions are going to tell you that you stop when no more cloudy drops happen. So when the drops go clear, that is a very good sign that the only thing that's coming over at this point is nothing more than just water. So when the drops go clear, that is when you stop this entire process and you let it cool down. And you keep going until it goes clear. So for some people, they'll be heating this for an hour, two hours, three hours. And then for other people, you'll be done in an hour and you'll be out. So that's the problem with the steam distillation. We just never know how it's going to behave on any given kind of day. All right, uh, here's a picture of one of the joints, but what I wanted to show you here, not the T-clip, which is what you see in the middle, but what I do want to show you is something that we've talked about before in the past, and that is this little pool of liquid that's getting generated there at the top end of the West Condenser. So if you noticed, that little pool is a very cloudy layer. It's cloudy liquid. So that's a very good sign that clove oil is right there. So I need to make sure that at the end of this process, I take this joint apart and I dump any residual liquid that is left over right there in that neck into my receiving flask over on the right hand side so a lot of people forget about that they ignore it but that is liquid that we do want to recover because it did come up and over and just the way that this thing is made it can cause a problem sometimes with that all right uh, observational changes here we go uh, here's inside of the biomask flask and inside of that biomask flask this is like an hour into it at, at this point what do you see? Anything different? If so, then you need to write that down into your lab notebook. Uh, tell me what you see that's a little bit different than how this process started, and then you can kind of go from there. All right. Uh, I also want to show you a video at this point in the process. So once again, about an hour in, what do we see? So here's the biomass flask after it has began to drip cloudiness for me in the receiving flask. If you notice, it looks like a huge mound that has happened in the flask. And this is kind of normal. I mean, the reason that this has happened is that this is building up steam and it's building up pressure. And all of that steam and pressure and vapor is getting pushed up through the biomask flask that you see here. And because it's getting pushed up, it's kind of creating a well in the center for all of this to escape through. Uh, up at the top, you're going to see that that vapor continues on and we are getting condensate at this point. You're seeing a pool of liquid that is getting collected right up here at the top of the West Condenser. So right in there. And then as we travel over, you're seeing drops that begin to happen. You just saw one that outpaced the camera. And on the receiving flask, I'm seeing drip, 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 drip. Notice the observations of the drips and down into the flask below, you're seeing what that condensate looks like. So if I zoom into the bottom of the flask, you'll be able to tell that a little bit better, maybe from that point of view.
Okay, so what I normally tell people is that you constantly want to check on that Florence flask. You want to make sure that your liquid level is not getting really low as far as water is concerned. Uh, if it does get low, you need to fill this full of water. And when you do that, it's going to be room temperature water. So it's going to take a little bit longer for it to boil and start the process back up again. So this is something that we don't want to do unless we absolutely have to. So just keep checking on this side of the house as far as the steam distance goes again you can make your observations here once again one more hour into the uh, process uh, is what this begins to look like uh, the entire setup as it's distilling folks here you go this is what the entire thing looks like so water Clayson condenser biomask flask with the clove and then this sidearm adapter the West condenser the drip adapter and then the receiving beaker that's on this side that at this point is getting cloudy liquid. All right, so I'm just going to let this keep churning, okay? I'm just going to let this keep rolling, 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 like Tina Turner down the river, and more distillate is going to happen. So I'll just keep letting this go until those drops go clear. Guys, what you're seeing in this video is the distillate that's coming from the cloves. And at this point, if you take a look at the drips, you're actually seeing those drips be very, very clear. And that's a very good sign that this is over. So a lot of the cloudy drops have already happened, of course. And as you can tell, right here in the beaker, that's where all of that distillate has been collected. All of that distillate, very cloudy because I have two layers. One's an aqueous layer, which was the water vapor, and the other layer is going to be some clove oil that is more organic in nature. Okay, so this is a 600 mil beaker. If I had to estimate how much distillate I received from this, uh, I'm going to say at least 300 to 350. That is where it began to stop. Later or closer to the end of this process, the steam generator did change at least on me a little bit and this is what it began to look like. Okay, so why? Am I burning water? No, 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 I'm not burning water. At least I hope I'm not. I know some people that could burn water, but that's hopefully not me. And it's hopefully not you either. But this is coming from the clove juice. You know, sometimes as this steam works itself up, there's going to be a liquid pull that begins to happen in the biomask flask. And in that biomask flask, if it can't get rid of all of the liquid, it's got to go somewhere probably, and it's going to go down. So I'm starting to see a little bit of clove juice or clove water, not oil, just clove water that's getting added into that um, water that's sitting into my Florence flask. So over time, that's just begin to be the thing. All right. Uh, here is the, um, uh, insulation for the biomask flask and the triple neck. Over time, what I actually saw is that it was having a harder and harder time to get up and over. So just like before, we're going to wrap it with aluminum foil and that will help ensure that it does get hot and stay hot and go over to my condenser. Uh, the steam generator, uh, over time toward the end, this color got darker as there was more clove water that came into that pitcher. Uh, and this was okay with me because it was still getting heated, it was still generating steam, and that steam was still going over to those cloves and extracting the clove oil from that. So this was not a big deal, but it was an observational change that you might need to make in your lab notebook. Uh, the distillate, this is kind of the process. The video showed you kind of happened at the end, but this was the process of it filling up. Uh, here's about 150 mils. It's still milky. It's still cloudy. It's still cloudy drops. Uh, and then finally here toward the end, it was a clear drop that was coming out. Uh, and if you take a look at the surface of this distillate, you would actually be able to see the clove oil. And I have a picture of that in just a minute. But this process stopped at 5.27 p.m. All right, so if I go back and we take a look at when it actually started, it started at 1.54 p.m. 1.54, 2 o'clock, is the time that I cranked the heat onto the sucker. And by the time it was finished, we were looking at about 5.30. 
All right, so that will give you an idea of how long this process actually took in the lab. Uh, if I took a picture and showed you the surface and I did of that distillate, this is what it looks like. All right, and the reason that I want to show you this is because you can clearly see bubbles that are up here on the surface of this water layer, right? I mean, we see that. It's all over the place. That is your organic clove oil. That's right, folks. That's all that you get. So with this process, you're going to get the majority of this water. And clove oil will be part of that. But we're talking extremely tiny amounts. And this is the problem with oils and essential oils. That is just what happens. That's why they're so expensive. You get very little oil out of these products. And if you want enough to fill up a container or a vial to sell, you're going to have to have tons and tons of material. Okay, so after heating up, now the heat is off. We're cooling this back down. Here is a picture of the biomask flask if you need to make observations of that step. And then here is the steam generator or our Florence flask. And this is also in the process of cooling down at this point. And you can make observational changes there if you need it. All right. So at this point, what I did is that I walked away. I walked away from the lab. I just let this stuff cool down. I let the oil stay in the water. This was not a problem. It wasn't going to go anywhere. I mean, it doesn't have a really low boiling point. It's going to stay there. And then I came back on a brand new day. A brand new day, the next day, is when I came in to pick back up where I left off. So I took another picture of the boiling flask. This is completely cooled at this point. So this was the day after I used it. So if you want to make observation changes there, you can. And I also took another picture of the biomask flask. And that's what you're seeing here. So once more, if you want to make observational changes, you can. And this was one day after the fact, completely cooled. As far as the distillate goes, this is what the distillate begins to look like. One day after it has cooled. Notice that all of those little separate oil droplets that were up there has kind of come together in one big blob. I mean, we see that with a little bit of residual stuff that's in there as well. But that is the observations of the distillate after this process is finished. All right, so now it's going to be my job to go in and separate this clove oil from the water. And I've got an aqueous and an organic. So I need to separate two layers from each other. And I hope that you're going to tell me, well, you use a separatory funnel in order to do it. And we do. We use a separatory funnel. So I'm going to pour that distillate into the separatory funnel. And when I do that, I look at the beaker, and this is what's left over. Now, this is not liquid. I know it kind of looks that way. But this was kind of weird to me because this was actually solid chunk that was in the bottom of this beaker. And I don't really know where that came from. I have no clue. But it was like a solid, rocky, chunky-like material that was left over. And I did not feel good about transferring this over. And the reason is because if that did not dissolve, it was going to stop up the stop cock in the separatory funnel. And there would be no way that I could have poured this liquid through that small, tiny opening in the stop cock. So I just made the decision to leave this behind. There was a little bit of water that was left over, okay? And I'll tell you what I did with that in just a minute. But here I have a problem, and I just do not feel comfortable about transferring this rocky-like substance that was in the bottom of this beaker over into that separatory funnel. And once more, I have no clue what this is. So I just left it there. All right, so in the separatory funnel, I pour our solution in. And then we're going to have to extract the organic with something, aren't we? And we need something that's a little bit more organic. So that's this extraction solvent of methylene chloride. So methylene chloride or dichloromethane, it goes by both names. The manufacturer here is Fisher Scientific. And the lot number is 103387. So we see that over here to the right-hand side. 
So methylene chloride makes a great organic solvent. It does not mix with water. It's going to go into that water layer. It's going to grab all of my clove oil, and it's going to help pull that clove oil out of the water solution. So the lab directions tell me to use so much, right, and do this wash twice, not one time, but twice. Uh, this is just kind of a guideline. I can kind of use whatever I want to use. It doesn't really matter. So I just took a graduated cylinder, and I just filled it up to the 45 mil mark. That's all that I did. And that 45 mils is what I'll use to wash the separatory funnel twice. So I'm going to take some of that 45 mils, and I'm going to pour it into the separatory funnel. And this was about 25 mils worth. All right, so 25 mils worth goes into the separatory funnel. Here you're seeing me actually pour it into the separatory funnel. And then I need to take these two layers and I need to make sure that I mix them properly. So I'll take the separatory funnel and I'll turn it on its top. Notice my finger down here on the plug. If not, it's going to pop out and all my stuff is going to get dumped. And you're probably laughing and snickering and say, why did he even tell me that? And that's because students have actually done that in the past. So I have to talk about these details. All right, so I'm going to give this a good shake or a good twist and a roll. And every now and then I'm going to go up to the stopcock and I'm going to open it up and uh, as it's pointing up and I'll hear it vent. And again, it will go and then I'll close it back. All right, did you like that sound effect? I'll do that again. That's what it does. All right, so I'll do it, roll it, rock it, open it to vent it, and then I'll close it back. And then I'll roll it, rock it, and then I'll vent it, and then I'll close it back. And then I'll put it onto my holder, on the ring stand, and then I just allow it to separate. All right, so here's a video of that process. So I want to show you the methylene chloride addition to the separatory funnel. Uh, right now this cloudy layer here is the uh, water with a little bit of clove oil that I need to extract from that water layer. What you're seeing at the bottom is the first small portion of methylene chloride that I've added. The reason I know that that is my methylene chloride is because use a little bit of common sense. It's a very small amount that I am adding and that very small amount is settling at the bottom of my separatory funnel. I can see that getting a little bit bigger and bigger. And I know that my water layer is the most amount of volume out of the two. So here I'm very clear cut on which layer is which. And that's simply based on the addition of the methylene chloride. And I am actively watching it as it's separating into the separatory funnel. So methylene chloride is going to be here at the bottom. This is going to grab my clove oil and pull it out of the water solution. And and it's going to be my job to drain this layer off, keep it in a beaker, and then do this again. Add more methylene chloride, give it a good rock, give it a good shake, and then allow it to separate and drain off one more time. Okay, so in that video, uh, this is not the entire 25 mils. This was just in the beginning, and I wanted you to show, or I wanted to show you the addition of the methylene chloride, so that way you can actually see that layer get bigger and bigger as we add that solution into my water. So that way you'll know which layer to keep because it's extracting the clove oil. And that's the layer that I want because that's the layer that now has my clove oil in it, not the water or the cloudy layer that's left behind. So I go to the balance. The reason I go to the balance is because I'm getting ready to drain this material off into a beaker and I'm going to evaporate the methylene chloride off. And what will be left over will be clove oil. So it's very important that I get the mass of the beaker that I'm using because that beaker will eventually have my clove oil in it. And I don't want another transfer. I want to make sure that when it goes in there, it stays in there. I do not want to transport it to another container because I'm going to lose even more of my product if I do. So I go to the balance, I tear it out 0, 0.00, and then I put on a beaker, a small beaker, and that small beaker is going to weigh 51.3497 grams. All right. So then I take this beaker that will eventually get my clove oil, I walk it over to the separatory funnel, and I begin to drain the methylene chloride into that 100 ml beaker. All right, so as I drain, you can see up here at the very top, 
this is all a clear layer right here. So this is methylene chloride, or we abbreviate it DCM. By the way, DCM, dichloromethylene, or MeCl2, methylene chloride. Both of those will work. Both of those are the abbreviations to that reagent. So DCM is going to be drained off into that 100 ml flask that sits down below. And that's exactly what I do. So I open the stopcock up. I slowly let it drip, drip, drip into that beaker until that cloudy layer gets near the stopcock area. All right, so then I turn the valve off. I go back and I take a look at my beaker that had the original stuff in it, that solid chunk. And folks, I actually added methylene chloride to this beaker as well. And I gave it a swirl. And it did not break up the solid chunk. So once again, I don't really know what that solid chunk was. And because methylene chloride did not break it up, I knew that water wasn't going to break it up. So if I did put this into my separatory funnel, it would stop up the stopcock area of the step funnel. So I just made the decision not to worry with this beaker anymore. I set it to the side and I said, if this is loss, it's loss. But I am not taking the risk of completely messing up the separatory funnel separation based off of a few granules of unknown stuff that's in the bottom of the speaker. So if we do get low percent yield, this could be one of the reasons. And I just don't know that yet because I haven't worked out the numbers, right? At this point, I'm just taking a guess. But if we do get percent yield that's somewhat lower than what it should be, well, here's some oil that could have been left over that I could have reclaimed but I wasn't going to take the risk in it. So I added more methylene chloride, my next portion, uh, to the separatory funnel. I actually did more than what I originally weighed out. Uh, the first edition, I did 25 mils, and then I added some of that methylene chloride into that beaker and gave it a swirl. It didn't dissolve those crystals up. So I took the graduated cylinder, and I added another 30 mils of methylene chloride into that separatory funnel. So it separated once more just like it should, and then I drained that bottom layer off just like before, and I added this methylene chloride layer with my first portion. So I'm going to have about 50 to 60 milliliters in total of stuff that I need to evaporate off. All right, and that will be my next step. So my next step is the evaporation of the solvent. This began at about 2.11 p.m. on that particular day. I took that beaker with the methylene chloride and my clove oil at this point, and I put it on a hot plate. It's not going to take a lot of heat. That's because methylene chloride has a boiling point that's super, super low. All right. Once again, I can hold my hand over methylene chloride, and those vapors, as it boils, will be extremely cold. It's the weirdest thing, but that's how methylene chloride works. All right, so I'm going to put some heat onto this beaker. I'm going to evaporate off all of that carcinogenic methylene chloride in our lab. And then hopefully what we have left over is a little bit of clove oil. And here's the process. This is my methylene chloride layer that I've received from the separatory funnel. And in this methylene chloride, I also have clove oil. It's my job to evaporate off the methylene chloride. Uh, this is not a big deal. Methylene chloride has a really low boiling point, and that's what you're seeing here. It's already starting to boil on me. And it's so low that if, again, if I put my hands over the top of the beaker, it's going to feel kind of cool to me. It's not going to be warm, and it's not going to be hot like boiling water. So this is not going to take a long amount of time at all. I'm just going to set it on the hot plate. I'm going to let it kind of do its thing for just a couple of minutes. All of that methylene chloride will be boiled off at that point and I'll come back and I'll have some residue left over and that residue will be clove oil. All right guys, so there's the methylene chloride on the hot plate and I'm slowly evaporating that stuff off. And what do I end up with? Well, as I look over, I end up with something that looks like this. Oh gosh, where's all my stuff going? And then something that looks like this? Oh, even more of it disappeared. What's going on?
What you're looking at right now is my clove oil. Yeah, all of that hard work, all of that setup, just for a remnant. That's all that I have. So you can uh, use this video to get some observations of the final product. Uh, you can uh, talk about the colors, you can talk about the viscosity maybe of it, but folks this is the clove oil at the very end. Now how am I going to prove that this is clove oil? Well what I'll do is I'll run it on the FTIR instrument and hopefully the fingerprint of the eugenol will match what's inside of my beaker right here. But that's all there is. That's all that I have as a product. And you can imagine how much clove it would take in order to fill up a small tincture bottle. And that's why essential oils are so freaking expensive. All right, guys, so that's all of the product that I was actually expecting. Uh, actually, that was more product than I was expecting uh, due to the transfers and what we left behind and so forth. This is just the nature of essential oils. So this is not a big deal, but it kind of is depressing in a way because all the hard work that we put in in order to get to this point, and we just have a couple of milliliters of clove oil uh, in the end. And that's why this lab is so disappointing sometimes. All right. As you can imagine, if you did not go to full completion of the distillation, if you did lose a lot of your oil product through the transfers and so forth, then this issue is going to be even bigger and you will not have uh, hardly anything left over at the end of this process. And some people had to do it again in the past. That's just the nature of it. All right, so this evaporation stopped at 2.36 p.m. All right, so once again, 2.11 is when we put it on the hot plate. 2.36 is when I took it off the hot plate and I let it slightly cool. Uh, here's the side view of that beaker. You can see the clove oil here in the very bottom. Not a lot at all. Uh, there, again, is the picture of the clove oil final product, so you can make your observations there. And I took that beaker back to the balance and I did a mass of it before I did anything else with it. And it's 52.5682 grams. Now here's the thing folks, in the lab procedure, there is another part of this reaction, I guess if that's what you wanna call it, that they want you to do. And this is adding some more reagents. And I think some of these reagents are things like sodium hydroxide. And it says that it makes sure that it forms eugenol uh, and converts all of these other things over to eugenol. We have never done this step. You lose even more product because of it. It's another transfer, it's another addition, it's another separation. And we just don't really feel comfortable because of that. The reason is because in the past, people have lost product in that step because they do not perform it the proper way. And then we compare numbers to people that do not do that step. And folks, the people that don't do the step still get a very high quality product and they still get a substantial amount that they should. So we have left off that entire part of the procedure. If you are following this video with the lab procedure as it's written, you'll notice that I completely skipped over a step and that is why. All right, so I'm gonna take this over to the FTIR. And if you need a review of FTIR, you'll know where to find that. That's gonna be in the ethanol probably lab. That's the first time that you've seen it. That's where the directions are gonna be, how to start at the machine and so forth. I'm not gonna do that as a rehash here again. You can find that in ethanol. That'll save us some time here. It'll save you some time as well. And if you did your job the right way, then in the appendix, all of those directions should be written anyway. You should not have to redo it, but you want to refer to that appendix in your laboratory notebook right up here, okay? So I'm gonna take our product, and our product is the clove oil, and I'm gonna use one of these glass disposable pipettes. I'm gonna suck up a little bit of clove oil, and I'm gonna put it onto our FTIR instrument.
So we're getting ready to test the eugenol. It's actually already running, but I just want to make sure that this is clove oil. And the way that we'll do this is I'll take the product that we've received from the steam distillation, and I've just sucked up a little bit into the dropper, and I've just applied a few drops of that onto the FTIR plate that's right there. You can actually still see it on the diamond, and the machine is running through the infrared spectra of this particular product as we are watching this video. So over on the computer screen, I have hit start search, and in doing so, I see an infrared that begins to show up on my computer screen, and this is what it looks like. So once again, it's a series of lines. You have no clue what these lines represent, but that's okay. You will eventually get to that point in our program. Uh, and I can go ahead and tell you that I can look at this infrared, and I feel very comfortable that it will pop out eugenol or clove oil after this analysis is over. Well, in addition to that, we're also going to do another confirmation. And the confirmation that we're going to do is we're going to be using the pure eugenol that we have ordered from a chemical company. So this will allow me to compare pure eugenol or clove oil to my product. We're going to run both of these on FTIR and hopefully it will label and identify both of them the same. Okay, so there was a video of me putting the clove oil onto the FTIR uh, instrument, and in particular, it was the ATR attachment. That's what we call that uh, diamond plate. So this diamond is called ATR, and that ATR is inside of the FTIR. Attenuated total reflectance is what that stands for. All right, so at the end of this process, this is the image that showed up on the screen. Once more, this down here at the bottom, this represents my product that I've just ran. And then up here at the very top, this is going to be the best matched FTIR with it in its database. And you can see they look pretty close. So let's see what the instrument tells me that it's going to be. Folks, here is the uh, confirmation screen after it has ran the sample of eugenol. Uh, up here at the very top, I'm just going to go to this search bar. It's a pair of binoculars. You can maybe see the uh, arrow with the cursor at that point right now. I'm going to hit search, and then over here to the right-hand side, I'm going to go all the way down, and there's a bar that's here that's called Spectrum Search. I'm going to click it, and then this database is going to cross-reference what it has right now against the database uh, that uh, is in the software. So these two infrared spectras have been cross-referenced and then here at the very bottom you're going to see the search results and those search results sure enough spot number one and spot number two are both eugenol. The score on the very top line is 959. So this is a very good infrared read. It feels really, really good about what I have presented it. It feels really good about how the infrared is compared to the database. And if I look here, here is the infrared for my sample or from the eugenol that's in the database. And then right up above it is the infrared for my sample. And look at how these overlap. I mean, you can look at these comparisons right now and say that for the most part, they are overlapping almost every single piece along the spectrum. Over here to the left-hand side, can't get all of it at once, but here is my sample. Over here to the left-hand side, couldn't get it all at once. So here is my sample. And then here is the database sample. So even the little squigglies in the very beginning, it is picking up on and they are matching, which is why it's 959 for score. So folks, there's the infrared spectra. There you go. I feel really good about clove oil. We did extract it. What is left over in this tiny little beaker right there. Again, there's my product. It feels really good about what that is. So I think we did a good job.
All right, so there's the confirmation screen. You're gonna see this report uploaded into the laboratory folder so that way you can have it, print it off, put it into your lab notebook, uh, and just pretend like we did it together as a lab group because that's exactly what's happened. So now I need to run eugenol just to confirm that it can uh, see eugenol and label eugenol. And this is a laboratory ordered clove oil. This is pure eugenol. Uh, straight from cloves. I open this stuff up. It smells just like clove. There's no difference in it. Uh, and I want to say a couple of things about the name. Uh, first off, you see the EN, and in organic, EN represents EN, and EN is a carbon carbon double bond. Uh, we actually see the EN part of the name that happens right here. I'm not going to count these. This is something different, and if you've not taken organic, I don't want to get ahead of you, but that is representing the N part of eugenol. Now, the OL part, the OL part represents alcohol in organic chemistry. So that ends in OL, and eugenol ends in OL. So here we have the alcohol functional group that's on this molecule. So these are some of the things that it's going to be looking for when it does run the FTIR instrument. Uh, and here is the manufacturer of the eugenol that we've ordered from, Acros Organics. And then over on the right-hand side, you'll see the lot number. The lot number is A0239047. Again, it's A0239047. So I'm going to take the cap off of this. We keep this in the refrigerator, actually. We keep a lot of our essential oils in the fridge. We just feel a little bit better about them uh, if they are kept in the refrigerator and kept cold. Uh, I think it just improves the little bit of shelf life on them um, when, when we need it. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to take the cap off, and I'm going to suck up some of this eugenol, and you can make some observations of that liquid and kind of compare it to our liquid that we put on the FTIR. I do the same process here. I put a few drops on the ATR. I run it. I scan it. I search it. I database it. Uh, here is an image of the database search. And up here at the very top, notice it says eugenol again once more. But this time there's a different score that's associated with it. So I'll let you look at that score on the print report when you do print that off and attach it to your notebook. And that score will help kind of determine which one it liked a little better. Because the one it liked better, it's going to give it a higher score because it feels more comfortable with that particular one. And then here's a zoom in of that particular report. All right, folks, so that's it. That's it of the clove oil. That's all that this is. It was an introduction to steam distillation. And steam distillation, we do not often, but it is a process that can be done in a laboratory. And now you know how to do steam distillation. It's just basically a way that I can take a solid material, put it into a distillation setup, and then allow that solid material to be hit with steam only and not just be saturated in this water. This water is going to get up to 100. The steam is going to get even hotter to 200 and some, right? 212, I think, is what the temperature of the water is going to be. So it's hotter and it can extract that clove oil much, much better. All right, so there's the story with the clove oil. You know what to do with it, folks. You know to go through, write up your lab book, give me your observations, do some laboratory data. Not a lot here. We're just wanting to know how much oil there was in that particular type of sample. Uh, and then we'll just call it a day. So there's the clove oil. Good luck with it. Again, if you know question, if you have questions, you know how to get a hold of me. And until then, I'll talk to you next time.